Does anybody know what the Wonderpus Octopus looks like? Well, if you don't, I'm not surprised. It was a species that was discovered only in the 1980s, just about uh, 30 years ago, uh, which is hard to imagine that it took that long to discover this species because it has an unbelievably striking ex uh, appearance. It has a deep brown, almost black uh, coloring, but it appears with a very vibrant set of white stripes and spots all over it. It is a, a black and white octopus. It truly stands out in the sea, having such an amazing pattern. It almost looks like a zebra. That's what it reminds me of anyway. And uh, when I first saw this you know, film footage of this uh, particular creature, I was struck by how it really didn't seem to camouflage very well uh, in the environments where, where it was shown. Uh, it, of course, has these you know, dark and white stripes. It's going to have contrast wherever it appears. And when I first uh, learned about this, watching this video footage of this, uh, this octopus, I was also struck by the narrator's uh, explanation of this vibrant pattern and coloring of this octopus. He attempted, unconvincingly, in my opinion, to explain why the Wonderpus octopus was colored the way it was. Now, as a side note, I've always thought that attempts to explain why the flora and fauna of life has the characteristics that it does uh, are, are unconvincing. How in the world can the mind of a man explain the purpose of something, like the reason for hair growing in an armpit or horns growing on the uh, head of a, a male deer, when the only thing that a man can do is simply make observations and guess. At best, these, explanation, these attempts at explanations about why certain features exist, they only describe the function of these characteristics. It doesn't explain the purpose. These are mere observations. These explanations about why characteristics exist are only uh, descriptions. So back to the octopus. In the case of the Wonderpus octopus, the narrator explained that the creature had this striking black and white pattern and coloring so that predators would be warned and frightened away. Like, hey, don't eat me. That kind of thing. Now, at the time I read the, or well, listened to this, I, it didn't make any sense to me. And it still fails to make sense, because this pattern causes the creature to stand out from its surroundings. One might think that this pattern would actually draw attention of predators that it intends to scare away. Maybe if I had a chance to talk with this narrator, if he was sitting in the audience today, uh, and listening to my contention about his explanation, he would say, well, yes, of course. How in the world could a creature scare away a predator unless it first draws its attention? <laughs> it's that contradictory and uh, crazy of an explanation that uh, I, I could just imagine. But regardless, the notion of purpose must be determined by a designer. But this can be problematic when considering how evolutionists ascribe design. And of course, they don't really talk about design because these explanations of purposes, of characteristics, of flora and fauna, uh, they attempt to offer uh, these observations as a result of randomness. How can design be a result of randomness? In fact, it can't. 
I want to emphasize the point of randomness first. When something is random, it means that all possible outcomes have an equal probability of occurring. Anything that's possible can it has an equal chance of occurring. So to say that there is purpose behind randomness is a clear contradiction. When there is a purpose involved, obviously things cease to be random. To explain the miraculous success and diversity of life as a result of random probability is dumbfounding to me. How can the equal probability of anything happening result in the outcome of life in the complexity and diversity that we uh, observe it? Likewise, when a characteristic of life is theoretically the result of random chance, how can the world, how in the world can a purpose for that characteristic be declared? It simply can't. So it is not my intention to make these scientific arguments. I only offer these um, opinions, I'll go that far, uh, just to describe uh, the absurdities and the contradictions that uh, I personally see in when trying to explain the purpose of life in the absence of God. So if randomness doesn't do a very good job at explaining these things, the miracle of life and existence, then where can we look for answers? Well, since you're here today listening to me on these on this uh, Sabbath service, I think you know where we'll look. <laughs> we can look to the place where we look for the origin of all answers, and that is we look to God. So I have three parts that I'll be going through today. The purpose of creation, the purpose of our lives, and the purpose of the events in our lives. So if we go back, starting with the purpose of creation, that's where we'll begin. Now if we go back to the beginning of existence and conclude that the universe and all that is in it came together as a result of random chance. Even the idea of purpose and, meaning and <laughs> meaningfulness becomes totally void. If randomness is the cause of a transformation of the shapeless into the shaped, then there is no qualitative difference between the two states of being something that is completely void of any type of design is just as qualitatively uh, good as something that has shape, intelligence, as we understand existence to be today. And if that's the case, if you think about it, if there's randomness in everything, <laughs> there's no meaning to life. But that is not what the Bible states. That is not what uh, any person on the street who doesn't even know what the Bible is, I, I doubt that they would say that their life is meaningless. Even if they believe that there is randomness that causes the, everything to come together. The truth in the Bible is that there is meaning in everything. There is meaning and purpose from the very beginning, from even the uh, preceding the beginning, if you could imagine that. Turn with me to Isaiah 45, and I'll, uh, I will read verses 9 through 12. Isaiah 45, beginning in Verse 9. Woe to him who strives with his maker. Let the potsherd uh, strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him who forms it, What are you making? 
or shall your handiwork say, He has no hands? Woe to him who says to his father, What are you begetting? Or to the woman, What have you brought forth? Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his Maker, Ask me of, the th of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands. You command me. I have made the earth and created man on it. My hands stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts I have commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city and let my exiles go free, not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts. God calls out the people who say that random chance is the cause of creation here, and he condemns them. It is a disgrace and an insult to God when the theories of creation exclude him, and they say that he does not exist, and they say that he has no power to create when creation is the result of random chance. We need to put our trust in the purpose of God. And there is purpose behind creation, and it involves you and me. Let's go over to Romans 1, and we'll read verses 18 through 25. Romans 1, beginning in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. And we'll stop there. Creation itself provides us evidence of God's existence. All we have to do is observe a little bit. Look at the fact that we have intelligence. And uh, look at the beauty that you might see in a flower, or the, uh, the design of an eyeball, and the fact that it works, it functions, it can see. These these beautiful things that God has created uh, within life itself are clearly seen by us. They can be acknowledged by us too. And in fact, the godly are the ones who uh, express their acknowledgement of God. But it is the foolish who suppress that truth and turn away from God. The Bible clearly uh, describes here that there is uh, there's a smart way and a foolish way to go. And it just happens to be the opposite of the way that this world would have you believe. Citing uh, from Psalm 19 and verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Just making observations in the world around us makes design apparent. If we are to look at anything that has design, there's uh, more evidence that a designer is involved than random chance. I'm fortunate enough to have children, and uh, I've been able to observe the oh the that process of how children grow, how 
conception turns into gestation, gestation, excuse me. And uh, if any of you have had the chance to uh, make that same kind of observation, it is amazing. The fact that a life can be growing as a result of, you know, reproduction. It's, it's fantastically amazing. How in the world is it possible that that is a result of random chance without God? It just cannot be. Truly, the firmament, this place where we live, the life that we observe and the miracle of it, it declares God's handiwork. Observing the beauty and the complexity and the wonder of existence I simply demand a design. Anything less than that is um, an insult to God. Let's go over to Isaiah 46 and read verses 9 through 11. Get there in a moment. Okay, Isaiah 46 and verse 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken it. I also will bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I also will do it. Now, I've uh, read a few scriptures before this that describe the creation of God, how his hand has been in it. But was that just a whim? Absolutely not. God has had a plan from the very beginning, and it involves creation. He declares the end of his plan from the very beginning. Everything is intentional. There's no detail left out. God has had a plan since before time began. Things that are great and small. They are all by the will of God. God has a purpose, and it begins with his plan, and uh, it, it starts its implementation in creation that we participate in. Let's go over to Job 42 and verse 2. Job 42 and verse 2. This observation is made. I know that you can do ev everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. If God has had a plan, if he has a purpose and nothing can be withheld from him, it's going to happen. His plan will come to fruition. God's will is very powerful. And this creation, everything that is in front of us, everything that's behind us, everything that is right now is on purpose. There's no accident. Having declared the end from the beginning, we can add to this, that God has the power to control everything, too. His will is mighty. Everything that God has a plan for, he will do. Make no doubt about it. And of course, his will was that uh, this world, this universe, would come into existence. Going over to Psalm 33, uh, I'll read verses 6 through 9. 
Psalm 33 and verse 6. <clears throat> by the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. There is the evidence that God's will is powerful. When he spoke, it was done. And knowing that the plans of God are intentional, from the very beginning, from before the beginning even, it gives the nature of existence much more meaning. This is what God created. You and I are what God has created. And he did it on purpose. He did it by his will and by his word. And of course we know the word of God, that spokesman, was Jesus Christ. Let's go over to John 1, 1 and read a few verses there. John 1, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So much is described by these five verses. This describes Jesus Christ while he was in his glorified state, that word of God, the spokesman. Jesus Christ was the creator. And what did he create? Everything, of course, but it talks specifically about life. Life was in God's plan from the very beginning. And not just any life, but the life of you and I. That leads us into the purpose of our lives. The creation, of course, of the universe has meaning and purpose, but it is to support life is to support our lives. It's a common thing to ask, you know, why are you here? And uh, say that, or speak that question in the context of why are you here on these Sabbath services in this church, listening to the Word of God be expounded. But I ask it in a different context. Why are you here? Why are you alive? Why, why do you have a name and a personality and an existence? That's a question that we uh, have an answer for. And it's right here in the Word of God. I'll begin in Psalm 100 and read verses 1 through 3. Psalm 100, beginning in verse 1. Make a joyful shout to the, uh, to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. It's very simple. God has created us, each one of us, individually. It's, uh, we have not come to existence on our own. It's not something that we could have done uh, all by ourselves without God. What strikes me about this particular passage is that uh, the proclamation is for who to rejoice? 
all lands. That's everybody, not just a few people. All lands should rejoice because all life was created with the potential to be part of God's family. Every single person has that potential, either in this time or in the resurrection to come. And of course, this is something to rejoice about. Uh, it's one thing to live a life and uh, experience suffering and pain and agony and wonder, you know, why do I exist? Why am I here? Why do I have to go through this? But it is uh, something to know, something that we can be comforted in, that God has created us on purpose. He's brought us to life and, and given us the people to know on purpose. And it's something to rejoice about. Well, let's go over to Matthew 10 and read verses uh, 29 through 31. Matthew 10 and verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? In verse 30. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than sparrows. Than many sparrows. Not only does God know us, but he knows the smallest details of our lives. Every single one of you, he knows you. He knows every detail. He knows your thoughts. He knows our desires. He knows uh, what we need personally. We are valuable to him as well. We are part of his plan. This world may be created, but we are part of that creation. And not only that, but the little details in our life, God has had a part in intentionally as well. There are no accidents. Going over to Jeremiah 1 and verse 5, we find out that um, God knew us and in this example, Jeremiah is called out individually. Individually, way before we were born. Jeremiah 1 and verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah was known even before he was conceived. As we discussed already, God has declared the end of his plan from the very beginning. And that involves every detail of existence, especially us as individuals. Each one of us is known by God. Let's go over to Ephesians 1 and read verses 3 through 6. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to sonship as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the, the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. We can be encouraged to know that God chose us individually to be a part of his family, way before we were born. We exist for a purpose. We are to be holy, just as God is holy. We are predestined to be sons. It's there for us to take. 
That's comforting, right? We uh, have a wonderful opportunity that has been predetermined for us. It's something that God has written into our future history. And only we can mess it up. <laughs> we do have free will, after all. We can turn away from God. But that's not what God wants. It's not part of his plan. But it is comforting to know that we can succeed as long as we endure, as long as we don't turn away from God. Let's go to Acts 17, and I'll read verses 24 through 31. This is a bit of a stretch of scripture here. Acts 17. And verse 24, let me just make sure. Okay. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives life to all, uh, gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord, in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our beginning, our being rather. As also as some of you, your own poets, have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and men's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. The purpose of our lives is so simple and consistently stated throughout the Bible. It is this, that we are to be in the family of God, to be his sons, to be his offspring. We are to seek him. We are to find him. He is not far off, as it says in these scriptures here. He's right there. Right there. And this is pre-appointed for us. It's predetermined. It's planned. It's part of our life story that was written out before we even existed. God has it written out in the lives of those who have not yet been born. It's part of his plan. It gives our lives meaning, knowing that we have a role in it. We are part of something big, but that doesn't mean we are a small part. Every detail is very important to God, and that means that you are very important to him as well. Uh, please turn with me to Romans 9 and uh, verse 22. We'll read verses 22 and 23 here. Romans 9 and verse 22. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory now i've been talking about uh, mostly the the righteous people here uh, that the bible mentions but even here paul contemplates sinners what about the purpose of sinners. Those who reject the way of God, who are prepared for destruction, as it says here. 
they serve a purpose too. That they might serve as an example for us, something to help us understand the mercy of God, to help us understand the love of God, and the forgiveness and the great opportunity that is provided to us. Perhaps Paul contemplates that the sinners, those vessels for destruction, are there for us to understand the sacrifice of Jesus Christ so it is more meaningful to us and more compelling. This is the gift that we need to understand, the gift of glory. And that glory is there for us to grasp. Every detail is important to God. Let's go over to Second Timothy, and I'll read verses, uh, chapter one, and verse nine. Second Timothy one, and actually I'll begin in verse eight. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light uh, through the gospel. Jesus Christ was sacrificed for our sakes, we know that. He was sacrificed that we can obtain eternal life. And this was planned, as Paul states here, since before the beginning of time. For each one of us, individually. But why? Well, it's God's purpose. It says so right here. It is his own purpose that we are called to be part of his family. It's his purpose that Jesus Christ was brought to this earth to be sacrificed for us. And God knows you. He knows me. He knows the people who do not yet exist. Eternal life is the plan. Turn a page or two over to Titus 1. And I'll read verses 1 through 3. Titus 1 and verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Not only is our existence part of God's plan from the very beginning, but uh, we are also part of his plan to build a family. And we do that by obtaining eternal life, which God has promised to us from before time began. Eternal life is what God has given to each one of us as our purpose. It might be his purpose too, but it is given to us as our purpose, our reason for being. It's to obtain that end goal. This is a gift that he offers for us to take, but we need to be willing to live our lives so that we can obtain it. That means that we need to be uh, worthy and we need to uh, live a life that is in obedience to God and accepts the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We overcome sin. We seek forgiveness. And through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we have his righteousness working within us. And to do this, it requires going through a thing we call life. We may exist, we may understand what God's purpose is for us, but we also need to know what the purpose 
of the events in our life are for. So that leads me into this last part of my message today, which is the purpose of the events in our life. We can be comforted, we should be comforted to know that God is very consciously aware of our existence. He's directly involved, too. There is purpose and there is meaning in the events that occur in our lives. All the consequences. Please turn with me to John 3, 16 and 17. John 3, 16. It reads the following. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his own Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world, through him, might be saved. Before talking about you and I, I want to talk about the life of Jesus Christ. He was manifest in the flesh for a specific purpose. He encountered a lot of different experiences. He was taunted by Satan, as we heard in the sermonette today by Mr. Rob Harris. He had to go through that. He had to understand what it was like to live as a human being. He lived in the flesh so that he can be the righteous judge of those who have lived in the flesh, of you and I. The events that he encountered were for a very specific reason, every little small detail. But the greatest part of the life of Jesus Christ and the events within it occurred and culminated in the sacrifice that he endured. He gave his life. God brought him to this earth, manifested him in the flesh as a man, so that his life might fulfill that very important part of his plan. So that all mankind might have a way of obtaining forgiveness, so that they might have a way of having the complete, perfect righteousness live within them. The ultimate plan, as we've described, is that God wants a family. He wants as many people in his family as are willing to uh, to uh, submit to God and accept that way of life. And this is why Jesus Christ was brought to this earth for you and me so that we may fulfill our purpose. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes 9 and I'll begin in verse 1. I have a, a set of scriptures that we'll go through in Ecclesiastes 9. But it's important that we understand the uh, <laughs> the importance of our lives to God. First, Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 1, For I considered all this in my heart, so that I could declare it all, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. People know neither love nor hatred, but anything they see before them. Pausing there, when we submit our lives to God, when we allow the righteousness of Jesus Christ to live within us, we can be confident that the events that occur within our lives are in the hands of God. God is in control of everything, all the context, all the, uh, um, all the events in our lives, all of our circumstances, they're in the hand of God. What a comfort. <laughs> when we are reflecting upon why we have to go through something that's difficult or painful or burdensome, 
It may not be something that we can just get out of, but it is comforting to know that God's hand is in it. He's got our back. It may be a test for us to go through, but it's designed by God. It's on purpose. It's no accident. But there are some troubling thoughts here that are reflected as I continue through Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 2. All things come alike to all. One event happens to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good, the clean, and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As is the good, so is the sinner. He who takes an oath, as he who fears an oath. This is an evil that is uh, this is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that one thing happens to all. Truly the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that they go to the dead. But for him who is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. So what's he talking about here? While God's hand is in the events of the righteous, those same or similar events may happen to the wicked, too. It might not seem fair. And that's what Solomon says here. That it is an evil. It is not fair that one event may occur to all men, regardless of their dedication to God. But that misses the point. God is involved in the lives of the righteous. And that the plan is to obtain eternal life. That's the point to cling to. It does not matter that an event happens to the righteous just as it happens to the wicked. The point is that for the righteous, it is planned by God. It is on purpose. It's the life and God's involvement that we need to draw away here. Uh, not the event, not any worldly success that might happen to uh, a sinner. It may seem unfair, but only in the worldly context. <laughs> in fact, what's unfair <laughs> is maybe that God uh, only works with the righteous. Uh, but that's from the worldly context. Of course, we're not speaking that God is unfair in any way. Continuing in Ecclesiastes 9, I'd like to read verse 11. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor the bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. The people that are referred to here, those wise and strong and uh, quick, the swift ones, those are the ones who trust in their own gifts. Those are the ones who do not trust in God. Those are the ones who have rejected God's involvement in their lives. And what happens to them? Heh. Chance. Those events are not in the hand of God. While the events of the righteous are in the hands of God, the others are left to time and chance. That means a good event might happen, or a bad event. They just have to get lucky. This is something that uh, Asaph, one of the writers of the Psalms, uh, contemplated as well. And uh, I'd like to read one with you. This is Psalm 73 and verses 1 through 5, where Asaph contemplates some of the uh, these similar troubling thoughts. Psalm 73 and verse 1. Truly, God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. 
They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. And he continues to expound upon this. Asaph contemplates the apparent injustice, that unfairness, that those who do not obey God still prosper. He's envious that they find success while the godly continue to suffer. And maybe these thoughts have crossed your mind too. Why, why do I have to suffer? I'm working so hard to do what's right, and I still suffer in this world. But the worldly suffering, the worldly success that might be experienced by us or by anybody in the world, all of that is short-sighted. That is not the end of God's plan. God's plan, remember, is that we will be part of his family. If you scan down uh, to Psalm 73:16, Asaph draws a conclusion. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went to the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors as a dream when one awakes. So, Lord, when you awake, you should despise their image. Even when good things happen to those who don't submit their lives to God, it should not be cause for us to lose faith. God is no respecter of persons, but he judges all according to the same standard. When man relies on himself, God doesn't get involved. Indeed, people may find great success by worldly measures, but if they reject God, God will not be in their lives. They'll be left alone to fend for themselves without God uh, managing the circumstances of their lives. But the events that happen in the people's lives who submit their lives to God, who are willing to obey Him, those events are watched very carefully by God. They are kept in check. God manages our troubles if we let Him. But if we don't want God in our lives, forget it. Time and chance for you. Hope you're lucky. So there's purpose in our lives, in every event, if we are willing to submit to God. Let's go to John 9 and read verses 1 through 4. Here we read about the life of a man. John 9 and verse 1. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. In this case, the observers thought they knew, they thought they were clever, they thought they knew what the reason was for this man's blindness. Just as the narrator describes the pattern and the purpose of, man, of the uh, octopus's uh, coloring, these men believe that they understand the purpose for this man's blindness as punishment. But that's not what it was. That's not what it turns out God's plan was for this man to be blind. What is it? In this case, this man's circumstances, his blindness, was for a purpose, a very important purpose in God's plan. He was blind so that he could be healed by Jesus Christ. And that by healing and becoming healed, that it might cause others to understand the mercy and the, the mir uh, miracle of Jesus Christ and follow him. That was the purpose of this man's circumstances. What's the purpose of your trouble? What's the purpose of your success? What are the purpose, purposes of the events that you experience? If you live 
close to God, you can be guaranteed that whatever events are in your life, easy or hard, are for the purpose of playing some role in bringing more life to the family of God. Let's go to Ephesians 2 and read verses 8 through 10. Ephesians 2 and verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Not only are we the creation of God, with his workmanship, but the opportunity to exercise our uh, righteousness, good works, those are prepared by God beforehand as well. God's purpose for us is to train in this life in righteousness. Let's go to Philippians 1 and verse 12. That should be just a page over or so. Philippians 1, beginning in verse 12. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul was in jail. He was chained up. He was a prisoner. You talk about dire circumstances, this is it. But what does Paul say? He says this is part of God's plan. It is better that I'm here than not. It has helped to further the gospel. He's been able to share it with people who would not otherwise uh, have heard about the gospel. It is making others who are Christians stronger in their uh, in their belief and their faith as well. Nothing is by accident. Paul was in chains on purpose so that the gospel might be preached more effectively and so that you and I can have an opportunity to be part of his family. Let's go to Isaiah 57 and read verses 1 through 2. Of all the circumstances in life that are encountered, death is one of the most difficult for people to understand. But Isaiah 51, or 57 verse 1 uh, provides us some context. The righteous perishes and no man takes it to heart. Merciful men are taken away while no one considers that the righteous is taken away from evil. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. Even when bad things happen, the ultimate being the loss of life, of death, God's hand is in that too. The righteous who have died have been relieved of the evil that is inherent in this world. It's by design. God's hand is in all of our experiences. Please turn with me to Romans 8, and we'll read verses 28 through 30. Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. 
And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Even when we experience troubles in our lives, it is for the purpose of teaching us to draw closer to God. All of that works together. And it is not for any trivial reason. It is for God's purpose. It is for God's purpose in our lives individually to learn from a specific event. It is part of the purpose of creation. It is part of the purpose of God's ultimate plan that we experience the collective events and circumstances of our lives. They shape us, they train us to become righteous. Being convicted that this universe and our personal lives and our experiences are not an accident or random chance, but rather that all of this creation is intentional, we can be comforted we can be comforted and confident that our life has meaning. It has purpose. What you do matters. It matters to God. Whether your actions are great or small, they matter to God in ways that might seem trivial to you. Your life is important. It is full of purpose. God wants you to be in his family. He wants me to be in his family. He wants as many people who have existed and who will exist to be part of his family as possible. Let's go for one final scripture to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Second Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if, any was, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. This life is not the end of God's purpose in creation. It is just the beginning. It is this new life that will be created in us, in each one of us. The ultimate purpose of this physical existence and our lives involves a new creation, a family of God out in the future, very near, that involves you and me.